fight. Keep steady our steps according to your promise. Cast us not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. And uphold us with a living spirit. We are God's people. Through his word, he has given us wisdom and understanding to follow his ways. Yet there are times when we have chosen foolishness over wisdom, willful ignorance instead of understanding. Still, even now, our Heavenly Father invites us to come to Him and ask for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, Amen. Almighty God, in his infinite wisdom and grace, sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die and rise for our sins. Because of Jesus, the joy of our salvation is restored, and no iniquity can remain in dominion over us. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven in Christ. We have been cleansed of our sin. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the source of all that is just and good, nourish in us every virtue and bring to completion every good intent that we may grow in grace and bring forth the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And please be seated for the reading of Scripture. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy 4. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the just decrees that I am teaching you, and do them, that you may live. And go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and just decrees so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints 
and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. And please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And Jesus said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. I would invite the children forward for the children's message. You guys, come on down. Make sure I have everything here. I got that, and I got this, so we're good. All right. How we doing, y'all? Doing okay? Pretty good? Y'all back at school? Glad to be back a little bit? You already started? Good. Get some good book learning. You know? Careful. Well, speaking of learning, yeah, come on down. Have a seat. I want to read a couple of Bible verses here. We read them a minute ago, uh, but here's what it says in Deuteronomy 4. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to the word that I command you. Do not take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that he commanded you. So what this is saying is that when God gives us his word, we should listen to it and we should do what it says. It's kind of like when our parents tell us to do things or to not do things, we should listen to our parents and do what they tell us to do and not do what they tell us not to do. Can that be hard sometimes? It can be hard sometimes, right? Because most of us, and I'll tell you a little secret, adults are like this too sometimes. We just want to do what we want to do and not do what we know we're supposed to do. You feel like that sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Here's what the Bible tells us, though. The Bible tells us that God loves us, and so when God tells us to do things and to not do things, it's because those are the things that are best for us. And so we want to listen to and we want to do what God tells us to do. Do you think we can do what God tells us to do? I think we can. I think we can. Now, before you go back to your parents, we have a really neat thing that we're doing this morning, and I want you all to help me with it. So, let's go ahead and stand up. And if you look around the altar right now, what do we have that we don't normally have? We've got all these quilts here, don't we? Yeah, so here's what I want you all to do. I want you to spread out, go all the way, a couple of you all the way to the back. 
and otherwise on the sides, okay? All right, and I want you to put your hands on one or two or three, however many you think you can reach, the number of quilts that you think you can get, okay? And we're going to pray because these quilts are going to go to different places. And they're going to go to different people. And they're going to go to all kinds of people who they're going to help uh, and who they are going to bless, okay? And so what I want you to do is I'm going to say the prayer with my mouth. And I want you to pray it in your heads. And we're going to bless these quilts. And then they're going to go and they're going to bless other people, okay? So I see you guys stretched out. You're touching as many as you can. That's adorable. All right. So let's pray. And I'll pray, and you guys pray in your heads along with me, okay? Heavenly Father, your Son is the express image of your glory, so that when we behold him, we consider your unending mercy. Bless and sanctify these quilts. They are offered in honor of your Son, Jesus. Grant that all who use them may, by your grace, be strengthened in the true faith, that they may worship you with a steadfast heart. And now, and now let's pray like we normally do, okay? Pray with me. Dear Jesus, bless these quilts. Bless the people who receive them. May they draw closer to you. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, y'all can go back to your families. Okay, there we go. Yeah, isn't that great? All right, and the band will give us our next song.
Thank you, Ben. Thank you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we will look at Ephesians chapter 6 today. I know, thank you, I know we, uh, we looked at this Armor of God passage a couple of weeks ago with the kids, just as we kind of geared them up and got them ready to uh, send them back to school here for the fall. But there is certainly information for the rest of us to learn, to receive, to hear from what God has to say for us. What does it mean to put on the full armor of God? When do we need to do that? Why do we need to do that? Uh, What is happening and going on in this passage. It's a passage that discusses spiritual warfare and it's important for us to acknowledge that there is an enemy, that Satan exists, the devil exists. There is a cosmic conflict that exists between good and evil. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, would talk about this and Uh, Here's kind of what he said about what's happening here. Lewis said there are two equal and opposite mistakes that you can make regarding demons, spiritual forces, good versus evil, light versus dark. There's kind of two equal and opposite mistakes that you can make uh, when we talk about the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Uh, And on the one extreme, you can have an unhealthy interest in these things, right? That you attribute too much to them, that you see them everywhere you look, that everywhere and everywhere you turn, uh, it's, oh, there's a demon there. Uh, It's like, no, that's a fire hydrant. That's not a demon. It's it's okay. Uh, But some people can see those kinds of things everywhere. And on the other extreme, you can totally be skeptical and not believe in that at all, that, that you don't believe that such a thing exists, that there are not these warring powers that exist in our day and time. And the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And the problem is that our world and our culture, uh, the view of our culture uh, is that Uh, One of those two extremes is the way that it is rather than dealing with the reality that yes, such things do exist, yet they shouldn't be at the most forefront of our vision and our consideration and they also shouldn't be completely divorced from anything that we would ever look at or think about. These are real things that exist that there are paranormal activities uh, and and, and things of that nature, but uh, not to the point where we make all these movies about them and we have these exorcisms that take place on screen uh, and it just freaks us out and it's something that we laugh at or just go to to entertain us, to scare us, 
to give us a jump scare, uh, but rather there are real things that exist. Here's kind of how the Bible addresses this. We see it in Genesis 3, right, when our first parents encounter the devil, encounter Satan, and what does Satan do? Satan lies to them. Notice, though, that Satan doesn't leave fang marks on their flesh. Instead, he leaves lies in their hearts. See? So I kind of see that as the way we should consider this. Okay, fang marks on the flesh. That's the movies. That's the stories. That's the things that get attention. But what really matters is what happens in our hearts and the marks that he leaves upon those. So Ephesians 6 talks about this and to jump a little bit uh, earlier there, Ephesians 6, uh, I'll read 11 and 13. 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. And then again, we get it in 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. So we ask ourselves this morning, what is the armor of God? When should we put it on? How do we put it on? And what should we be thinking about when we do? So the first idea, what is the armor of God? Now know this, God uh, here, Paul, in speaking in Scripture to us, he's talking to Christians. It's a letter to a Christian church. We are a Christian church, so we receive Paul's letter in like kind. These are people who already have salvation and they have faith and they have the gospel and yet he tells them to put these things on. What does that mean? What does that look like? And what Paul is telling them is take what is already true of you and appropriate it in such a way that it protects you. So appropriate what God has already given you as a helmet, and as a breastplate, and as a shield, and, and as these things that will protect you. It's kind of like when he brings uh, things up in Ephesians chapter 3. He prays that Christ would dwell in God's people. Well, wait a minute. I'm, I'm baptized. I'm saved. I hear God's word. But now I, I want God to dwell in me all the more. See? So it's this extra entreatment, extra prayer. Uh, Lord, I, I, I want you even more so than before uh, for me as a Christian. By definition, I want to have all of these things. You could also think about it this way. Take what is objectively and externally true of Christians and pray that it would become internally and subjectively true for me in every step that I take in every breath that I breathe in every action that I commit it's Paul saying I know that you have faith I know that you have salvation I know that you have the peace of the Lord but you're not using them in order to fight the battles of life and 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 that's one of the reasons you have them. It's because they will help you. They will help you fight. And I want you not just to know it in your head. I want you to put it on. I want you to know that you are loved by the Father at infinite cost. And I want you to take that with you in every step that you take. So drill it in. So that when you're criticized or when you feel like you're failing, you internally, instinctively react as someone who is infinitely loved, someone who is infinitely accepted, someone who is infinitely saved by the God of the Bible. And can you do that? So that's what it means That's what it means to put it on. Take what is true of you and push it into your heart. 
and know it so that it creates new habits of the heart so that it dwells in your soul so that those are the reflexes that your heart has when it deals with other situations, other activities. It, it, it becomes who you are. So put on the full armor of God. Okay. That's how we do it. Now, when? When do we put on the armor of God? And as we read the passage, as we heard it read earlier, he says it over and over again. Stand firm. Stand firm. Because listen, you are already in the battle. Here's what it says in verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and it goes on and on, but it starts out with that verse, stand, therefore, stand firm. A single past completed action. Stand. Your armor is already on. You put it on before the battle. That's the order of operations. What about when you don't feel battles? What about when you don't feel challenges? Well, then you're just kind of coasting, right? You're kind of drifting along. You're drifting away. You're not working on deep spiritual growth. No, we, we want those things to be happening all the time, don't we? We want God's inspiration. We want God's guidance in all that we do, not just when we think we need it. Because otherwise, you're rolling and you're coasting and things seem to be okay and then the arrows appear in the air coming at you and you don't have the armor on. See? It's an issue. The truth is, the arming of your soul, the armoring of your soul takes time look at every single day as a testing ground because every day there are skirmishes going on there are opportunities for you to do battle so be ready today be ready today give you a couple of examples there are two i'll give you just two temptations that we deal with we face almost every day okay impatience with people and you may sit there and be like well I'm never impatient with people you're a liar we all are impatience with people okay and we've got this inner dialogue when we deal with somebody this person this person's a dummy this person doesn't understand what's going on uh, no wonder he or she Blah, 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 blah. You ever think that about somebody? Yes, you do. What if instead, though, we said, Lord, I wonder what I look like when other people look at me. I wonder what I look like when other people are impatient with me. Because I know that they surely are. But see, then you got to take that next step and say, Lord, I know there are people who are impatient with me, and yet you, Lord, are the most patient with me. Like, Lord, how do you even put up with me? Think about Jesus in the garden. Jesus praying in the garden the night he was betrayed and his disciples fall asleep on him. Now they just had the Passover meal, which means they drank at least four cups of wine. So I get it a little bit. But even then, what do, what do we say in the hymn, right? Watch with me this bitter hour. Just one, can, can you guys, one hour. And they don't. And they can't. Do you do that with the Lord? Do I do that with the Lord? 
You bet I do. And yet when we're dealing with other people, we look at them, we call them names. And our hearts become a little bit harder and we become a little more proud. And guess what? We've lost the battle. Being impatient with other people. That's just one example. I had an opportunity to put the armor on and I missed it. That's just one. Do you even want to go to number two? We're going to do it. Think about how much you worry. And yes, there are some people who worry more than others, and we can identify, we can think about some of them like, ah, she, she's just a worrier. You ever thought about somebody like that? You're worried, you're anxious, you're stressed out. Why? Because you've got this dialogue in your head that's saying, this has to happen. And it's not happening. Why not? Listen, worry, what we call being stressed out, that's a form of pride, isn't it? It's because we're all our own private control freak over our own lives and over our own things that we think we have control over. That's what worry comes from. That's where worry comes from, right? Because deep down, I'm worried that God won't get it right. You think about that. Sit in that for a minute. And so what happens is you let your heart go in that direction and guess what? You lose. And so then you're grumpy, you're unhappy, you're anxious, you're proud, and your heart hardens. And look, those are skirmishes compared to the big picture, aren't they? When we call them skirmishes, it's a big deal, but those are the things that we do and think about every single day, aren't they? It's true. Do you recognize what's going on there? There is spiritual warfare happening, brothers and sisters. So put your armor on. Put it on. How? How do we go about doing that? So we're given the items, right? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the word of God that we use to pray in the spirit. What does all this look like? Well, put on that belt of truth. It's the foundation of all of the other ones. Put on the belt. You know, back in the day, it would be this big leather sheath that they would have. It would offer... Uh, some form of protection against blows from the enemy. It's under all of the other armor. It's the foundation of everything. And then we put on everything else. You start with the truth of God, and then you put on righteousness, and you put on peace, and you put on salvation. These are specific privileges that we have in Christ that would not be possible without the foundation of the truth of God. The way Colossians tells it, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Put on the armor, take on the truth. Put on that breastplate of righteousness because you can't take an arrow there when you've got that on. Put on those shoes of the gospel of peace. Hike around with the gospel. It is important for routine operations to have the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Walk around with it every day. Watch what your heart says. It's the armor of God. It's not your willpower, it's his armor. Because if you think that there's a way to be a good person through 
willpower and not this armor thing, but just, well, I'll just do it myself. I'll figure it out myself. You, you're, you're treating it like something mechanical, right? Like something I can turn on and turn off like a light switch. That's not your whole person involved. That, that's a function of your will. That's not going to get it done. Because what happens is the thoughts of your heart lead to the feelings of your heart, and that leads to the actions of your will, and Satan is always trying to make the thoughts of your heart lies. Right? Well, I'll do that, but then I'll repent, and everything will be okay. Well, how do you know that you're going to want to repent? See? That's the problem with that. Sin is the suicidal action of the will against itself. Let me say that again. Sin is the suicidal action of the will against itself. See, every time you do something wrong, it makes it harder to resist the temptation to do it again. And we know this to be true, right? Once you let sin in the first time, it becomes a lot easier the second time to do the thing. Psalm 103, right? The psalmist says, forget not your benefits, Lord. When you sin against him, you are forgetting his benefits. Do you know that? Or do you drift? Do you coast? Do you let it get you off the path? No, let's... Let's put it on. Let's put on that breastplate of righteousness that reminds us who we are in Christ. Let's put on those shoes of the gospel that will remind us of the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's put on that helmet of salvation that's that assurance that, that we can go on. We have salvation. Jesus has one salvation for us. And then we kind of these last two, and they seem to be in a little bit of a different category, right? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, make supplication to the saints. So we said earlier, right? We put on the belt of truth, that's the foundation. We put Christ in our hearts. We've got that covered. We've got these other items that are the privileges, the aspects of the gospel. They remind us. It's drilled into us. It deals with the lies that Satan tells us. It deals with the cultural lies that are there all the time. But get your sword. The sword that is the word of God and use it to pray in the Spirit. Bible, prayer, Bible, prayer, Bible, prayer. How, how are you doing with that? This is this relationship that God calls us to, this spiritual friendship that he has with us, the way that he holds us accountable, the way that he draws us to himself. And he brings us together. And he gives us the gift of the church. It's why we have the preaching of the word. It's how we put the armor on. Now, when do we do all this? Who do we remember as we put on the armor of God? We started this talking about spiritual warfare And we sing about this sometimes in our hymns, don't we? We'll sing, Onward Christian Soldiers. Some people are are nervous with that, aren't they? They don't want to think about it in those terms. Makes people nervous. Think about it in context. In the Old Testament, God is a divine warrior. Remember this, when God's people crossed the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army was destroyed And Miriam sings. 
And she sings that God is a warrior, that he has fought for us, that he has liberated us, that he is good. And you keep reading the Old Testament and you read about the times when Israel becomes evil and in fact God fights against them. Why? Because they've aligned themselves against him, right? And so, he is against evil, whoever does it. And then we get to the end of the Old Testament, and God's people are in captivity, and the prophets write, and the prophets are yearning for a time when a divine warrior would show up and would liberate them from their captors, would drive out the Romans, and God would be triumphant once again. And then Jesus shows up. And Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man who who Daniel says will lead the angel armies to defeat evil on the earth. And Jesus shows up and God's people think, finally, the warrior is here. But he doesn't act that way. He doesn't wound, he heals. He doesn't raise an army. No, he teaches and he feeds and he loves people. And at the climax of Jesus' life, Peter draws his sword and Jesus says, no, put, put it away. Not the sword today. If Jesus came back to conquer the Romans, that wouldn't have changed the human condition, would it? Why? Because we're The problem, the evil, is us. Rather, Jesus did not come with a sword in his hand. He came with nails in his hands. He did not bring the sword of God's judgment. He didn't bear the sword. Instead, the sword fell on him. Jesus overcame evil with good. He didn't end the Romans. He ended sin, Satan, death, and hell. He ended evil itself. So that someday he could end evil without ending you and I. Hate Satan. You should. Hate evil. Hate sin. You should hate these things. But listen, if you hate people, Satan wins. You can't do that. Instead, fight like Jesus. Overcome evil with good. Forgive your enemies. Put the armor on and stand firm so that you can stand. Fight the good fight of faith by fighting the forces of evil like Jesus did. Every one of us can do that. Stand firm in the faith so that you may stand. In Jesus' good name, amen. All right, and we'll hear from the band.
And uh, we continue with the creed and the prayers. Please stand. And we confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. For all people who serve in various vocations, that they be given creativity, wisdom, understanding, discernment, and courage to follow where God is leading. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. For all those who celebrate good news of births and birthdays, anniversaries and baptisms, success at work or school, anything else that is worthy of praise, we thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. For all those who mourn the death of loved ones, we pray for comfort in the face of grief, Lord. (coughs) This morning we pray for the family and friends of Barbara Smithy. For uh, and also family and friends of Yolanda and Joe Salazar uh, and of David uh, Gerard uh, and those who we name in our hearts. Help them to grasp firmly our hope in the resurrection and eternal life with you. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. For all those who govern in this nation and throughout the world, that they lead and serve according to God's wisdom rather than the wisdom of the world. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. For all who fight the assaults of Satan, that they find strength and protection in the whole armor of God. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. For all who are sick, injured, and recovering, those awaiting or recovering from surgery, especially Lord Betty and Gary, for Kim, for uh, Riney, for Pam and O.W., for Shelby, for Kyle, for Shailen, for Maggie, for Elizabeth, and for those who we name in our hearts. That God would grant them healing according to his good and gracious will. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend. And I will praise you without Lord, we commend all these things to your infinite wisdom and guidance, knowing that you hear us. Amen. Amen. Hear us, Lord, as we pray together the prayer that you've given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
Till the glow goes out. There you go.